Good afternoon, and thanks for joining us here on Likeable Science on Think Tech Hawaii. I'm your host, Ethan Allen, and we're all about how science is a likeable, a vital, and an interesting and exciting part of everyone's life. Science is not something to be feared or stuck away in a cabinet or stuck up in an ivory tower somewhere. Science is all around us every day, every way. And we use it all, and we should all learn to love it. With me today to help me explore uh, very interesting parts of science are Ian Kitajima and Ken Jung, both from Oceanet. Thank you very much for joining me. Thank you for, Thanks for having us. So uh, Oceanet is an interesting group. It's a, what would you call it? It's a, it's a high-tech company, basically. Uh, it does all kinds of interesting work. Yeah, so I think people would describe it sometimes as a technology developer. We okay. develop all kinds of variety of technologies. Sometimes when I describe Oceana to people, I'll say, if you ever watch Big Bang Theory, kind of, sort of, <laughs> not so maybe that socially awkward, but more like um, James Bond. Uh -huh. So, you know, James Bond has this guy named Q, and Q invents all of these really cool things. He has a lab of engineers and scientists. Mm -hmm. And so that's kind of what I think of, like, like Ken is kind of like Q for us, oh, and okay. his group and a lot of the different parts of the company creates uh, new technologies and innovations for, for maybe not spies, but but really for um, different customers of the world. Yeah, you've got you've got a huge range of people who you've worked with, including I guess the Department of Defense, so among others, but mm -hmm. but also commercial concerns of various sorts, I guess. Right. And yeah, and I know you guys do all kinds of stuff. I know Leslie Ao, who I interviewed some years ago. Then later on, I talked to her, and she was into some sort of uh, uh, special clouds. Yeah, exactly, exactly. <laughs> uh, that could be used for spy work. There we go. Right. Yeah. Possibly. Yeah. Yeah. All exactly. Cool so they do all kinds of stuff. And, and plus, uh, Ian, you're on the Hawaii Workforce Development. Council, which really speaks to uh, Ocean being right. a very innovative company in the way they organize, the way they sure. work with their staff. Maybe, maybe you could tell us a little bit about that. Sure. So, so you know, you know, Ocean is you know a group of very highly educated, um, very creative, very passionate group of people trying to solve some of the most difficult problems in the world. I mean, that's probably one of the things that attract people to come to work at Ocean. It is the ability and the opportunity to solve really difficult problems mm -hmm. and work with really great people, like fantastic people like Ken and others mm -hmm. and Leslie, um, and do it from Hawaii. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of like right. the trifecta of like really <laughs> great things, doing things that are super meaningful, working with really great people and doing it from Hawaii. Exactly. And so um, we do get asked quite often um, you know, what kinds of jobs and careers um, are happening at Ocean Ed. And so if people went to our website and visited our website, you would see the various types of positions we're hiring for today. Mm -hmm. And then as part of the Workforce Development Council, is providing guidance and, and feedback about what we see for the future. Um, mm -hmm. How can we create uh, a diversified economy, which includes innovation and technology? Um, and so, of course, they, people ask us about what, what these jobs are. And at the same time, we are also trying to work with um, edu educators and education systems of, instead of just asking us and other tech companies what kinds of jobs are we creating, because there's a real big lagging factor, right? right. So what I tell you today is probably going to be obsolete in maybe two or three years. Right. So to say, create more of this is maybe very dangerous. Right. So what we're trying to do is change the conversation where we're asking people to think about, and for ourselves, what are those amazing, what we call superpower skills mm -hmm. um, that we can teach and give experiences, like what kind of skills and experiences can we give young people so that they can be prepared to most likely create their own careers? Right. And um, more attractively, maybe create Hawaii's next great technology innovation company. So instead of looking to ocean it and waiting for us to do something, really, how do we empower these young people with you know entrepreneurial skills, design thinking skills, coding skills, right. digital media skills, so they actually could create their own companies? Yeah, so exactly. that's way more empowering, I would I would say. Right, and you guys actually get train your own staff in this like the whole design thinking, thinking process, process, so they right. can go out and, and both think better themselves, but also right. teach their kids and yeah. model this for other people. Yeah. And and this is again, it's a great model for the, the other workforces around Hawaii right. to realize, yeah, this we live in a very different world today. It's not it's not a world where you sit there and put a widget together the same way uh, day in and day out, right? right. And I'm sure again, you the, the folks who you work with think very differently, they do very different jobs each day, right? Uh, for sure, we try to take um, people who are trained in a particular major or um, 
you know, expertise area and try to turn it upside down mm -hmm. and have them kind of unlearn what they learned in school or their previous career and become uh, kind of uh, persistent students. And, and uh, they're constantly learning new things because, like Ian said, the world's changing, technology is changing. So uh, we're constantly doing new things and asking people to become really versatile. Absolutely. Yeah, no, I was going to say that, you know, one of the things definitely that is super important for for us to create in, in, in school and students or just in people is like a love of learning, right? Because, you know, today is maybe we're doing this today, but in two years from now, we'll maybe be doing something very different. So if you don't want to learn right. new things or not curious about things, about how the world is changing or new areas, then it really is a hard, hard thing to stick, keep you could, up. You could become yeah. obsolete very yeah. quickly. Yeah, and yeah so absolutely. No, and I mean that's that's a really key thing, of course, that a good education should do is teach a kid to love learning, right? right and not re realize, <laughs> you know, realize that they are a learner, that this is something they do, they right. do it well, and they love doing it. Yeah. And then, you know, you can teach them about rocks or rocket ships, it really doesn't matter because they'll learn what they want to learn and they'll right. explore, yeah. yeah. Exactly, so so that's one of the things we look at for people at, mm. at OceanNet is, is people who are intensely curious, mm -hmm. who love to learn new things. So if you hate learning it's and don't want to learn anything <laughs> more, then Ocean is not like the place to be because right. it, it really is. Um, it's always changing. Mm -hmm. and, and that's kind of the environment um, we're constantly living in. Sure. It is for us. It's kind of accelerating. But again, always learning. And, um, yeah. and beyond learning, too, I would say um, have a, a nature of creativity. Mm -hmm. So um, same way that artists and musicians create, we, we create in the physics realm. Right, and, and the, the whole design thinking uh, mm. process is, is right. supposed to help build that kind of, it gives people at least a chance to practice their creative thinking skills, right? Yeah, exactly. And, and so, you know, Ken was mentioning, you know, how do we, um, part of it is this idea of reframing, you know, looking, sometimes we, look, we keep looking at, this, at, 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 the, at a problem and so we keep looking at it at, at the same way, and so we keep asking the same questions, and then but we still get the same answers, right? Right, and so it, you feel kind of stuck. And the thing around design thinking is is asking questions that are kind of outside the box. When you start with what you already know, mm -hmm. you're kind of starting with um, you're kind of starting inside the box. Right. And so in design thinking, it's so much around. How do we ask questions that are outside that box? And the questions tend to be, and here's the secret to all of this, I think around the design thinking piece is, when you ask user-centered questions, mm -hmm. questions like, you know, like we were just talking about riding motorcycles and the helmet you wear. Mm -hmm. So you could say, ask people, you know, redesign the motorcycle helmet. So tell me, Ethan, what you like about your motorcycle helmet. Mm -hmm. And that actually starts you off already in a box mm -hmm. around something that goes on your head. All right. Physically, that goes on your head. So I like, I like this. I don't like it. I, the thing I don't like is it gets hot. I get helmet right. hair. Right. But that kind of, and that's good information. But that starts you in the box. When you ask questions outside the box, which is, so Ethan, why do you ride motorcycles? Right. Yeah. Like, why do you ride? And tell me about the last time you went for a ride that was really enjoyable. Mm -hmm. That actually starts you outside the box right. and helps you to imagine potential new types of ways right. to allow you to ride with great freedom, but safely. Right. Right. And so there's a company in Sweden we always share that they actually invented a helmet that doesn't go on your head. It, you wear it around like a collar uh -huh. around your neck. Uh -huh. And in it is airbag technologies that deploy, if you start to fall, accelerometers detect your falling and it will deploy an air balloon helmet helmet huh. but it's a it's a helmet that doesn't go on your head right. you yeah. wear it around your neck right 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 so thinking so. about things differently is very it's very good practice for people <clears throat> uh, years ago I was uh, doing a little education workshop for a bunch of art artists mm. so I gave them each three sheets of paper which of course artists want to draw on or whatever and then gave each of them a fresh egg and said now your job is at t 10 minutes from now you're gonna drop your egg from 18 inches above the table surface and I don't want to see broken eggs here. Oh, you know? And they had to start thinking about how this paper could be used differently now. It's not just the surface to draw on, but right. a structural element, a three-dimensional, you know, and lots of interesting things come out of that. You know, yes. people build nests down there to catch it. People wrap the egg and, and protect it. One group did a beautiful funnel 
that actually oh, stood geez. up and caught the egg and then dumped it out carefully. You know, wow. Really, yeah, very, very interesting to see. And that was people, a team thing too. Yeah, yeah. Get, getting stuff. And I, I suspect you guys must do a lot of your work. Uh, That's a new one. I haven't heard about that, one, but we'll try that one. It'll be a little bit messy, but <laughs> <laughs> make it a little messy. But that right. no, sounds really great. Yeah, right? it's, it's a lot of fun. Right, awesome. So, but but again, as you say, getting getting people trying to think yeah. a new horizon, Horizons. frame the problem a little bit right. differently for them. Yeah, that's that's really critical, and and it's great to hear you guys are doing that. And you, but you do it in these, yeah, in these tremendously diverse fields and, and industries. From, right. uh, I mean, from how to get graffiti off a off a wall, which we have a video of for, for a little right. later, right, right. Uh, to how to how to uh, get condensation not to stick on you know, and, and rust away. Uh, right, exactly. You know. Yeah, so there's, I mean, that's kind of the beauty of, I think, where we work is, we, we may start here, but where we end up, we, it's a lot of times, many times, it's hard to know where we'll end up. And a lot of it is, again, inspired by being in the field, talking mm -hmm. to customers. You know, th this is the, the beauty of, I think, the kind of work we do. It is kind of like being an artist. It's, it's maybe like also what a jazz ensemble is, too. Uh -huh. they, start, they, they, start a ri they start a tune, and then from there, as people become part of it, they're, they're building on it. Mm -hmm. And as people, different people come in, they bring different points of views, and they bring different inspiration or different um, factors of pulling mm -hmm. this idea or technology into different places. And so... I think one of the important things we have at Oceanate is we've created a culture of experimentation Excellent. where where you can try things and, and it's really collaboration among groups is, is very much encouraged. And so part of it is we just went through a redesign of our office space as well. So space is actually a very important element mm -hmm. in helping to foster, I think, creativity and innovation. So literally physical space yeah. can make a really huge difference. And so our kitchen is about five times bigger now. There we go, good. Right, just because yeah. that's, sure. that's where a lot of the sure. creative, creative sparks have, are happening. Have yeah. casual exactly. conversations, bounce around ideas, and suddenly exactly. they're looking at their donut thinking, huh, I wonder how I could. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so now we're expecting like five times more innovation <laughs> happening because the kitchen is so much bigger. Excellent, excellent. Yeah, well, definitely. No, that, yeah, sounds, sounds very exciting. And yeah, there, there are, of course, there's a huge... Uh, uh, movement these days about building good learning environments, environments that will encourage le learning and learners, huh, and, and not keep it all in a right. in a box of the traditional classroom design of you know a teacher's desk and rows right. of, of neat little chairs sitting there for the kids. And our actually design, our redesign of our office was actually a major design thinking project uh -huh. because if you think about, you have to incorporate all of these different needs. Right. So somebody in HR has very different needs than somebody like who's doing nanotechnology work right. or somebody who's doing biology work or the guys who are doing marketing or the design thinking stuff we're doing. So you have a real variety of right. needs and stakeholders. So it was a great, in a way, design thinking exercise to yeah. incorporate all of that learning and needs and then design out um, a facility. Right, how, how you build the openness to really encourage a collaboration, but also the privacy and quiet time that people need for some kind, exactly. some parts of their work and all. Yeah, yeah. That's, yeah. I'm sure that must have been rough. Some of us have stand-up desks now. Huh? A bunch of us have stand-up desks. Our desk. programmers like to be in the dark corner. Yeah. <laughs> they like the dark. Yeah, when, I, when I do grant writing, you know, I really want to be in, in my own space, my own quiet room. I, you know, and that's that's what I, what I like. But then, yeah, when you're bouncing around ideas on how to get a project done, often, yeah, you want to be sitting around talking with your your peers and even people just wander by, right? Because sometimes a, some stranger will wander in and have some great idea, you know, doesn't know anything about your project. Yeah, yeah, exactly. yeah excellent. Well, hey, we're gonna we're gonna explore this more deeply. We're gonna look at some of the specific applications uh, that Ocean is doing. When we come back, but right now we're going to take a short break. Uh, again, I have Ian Kirajima and Ken Chung here from Oceanit, and I'm your host, Ethan Allen, and you're going to be back in one minute. Only. I'm Jay Fidel, and I'm here with Pete McGinnis-Mark to talk about HIGP and research in Manoa. What about that show, Pete? I think it's great, Jay. Research at Manoa really provides faculty members at the University of Hawaii with an easy way of explaining some of the research activities we're conducting on the campus. For example, I do a lot of space research, whether it's the Moon and Mars, but many of my other colleagues do other interesting kinds of work, whether it's exploring the ocean floor in submarines, studying earthquakes and tsunamis, or other activities. So research at Manoa really provides us with a way of telling the general public some of the activities which we're involved in, as well as communicating to our colleagues and students. That this is a fun science, and we really appreciate the activities which research at Manoa enable us to talk about. I love research at Manoa. Come around, join us. It's Monday, 1 o'clock p.m., every single Monday. Be there or be square. <laughs> 
And you're back here on Likeable Science here on Think Tech Hawaii. I'm your host, Ethan Allen. With me today on Think Tech Studios are Ken Chiung and Ian Kibikuma from Oceanit. And we're talking about the amazing sort of environment that Oceanit is. It's is an interesting learning space. Uh, Ian's experience with the Hawaii Workforce Development Council and, and what sort of the lessons that design thinking has to, to, uh, to, to teach. And, but I wanted to dig maybe a little deeper now in, into some, uh, some specific project. And it was sort of a hard choice because you guys do so many different things. <laughs> but I, I saw... Spin the wheel. <laughs> I saw some, some video that really intrigued me because it, it tied back to the days when I used to work uh, in a Center for Nanotechnology, mm. University of Washington. Uh, awesome. you, have, you do some work on hydrophobic and hydrophilic surfaces. I think, uh, uh, do I understand this was originally sort of targeted, somebody came to you and said, how can we get the water off of our heat, make our water not stick on our heat exchangers or something like that? Actually, before that, uh -huh. we started doing this work for the U.S. Navy uh -huh. on uh, some of the surfaces, like ship hulls. Okay. So this, if you can repel water, then you're able to um, maybe uh, mitigate some of the biofouling and corrosion that occurs right. with, that's associated with, with water and salt water uh -huh. in particular. And then we... Um, kind of pivot, pivoted and, and took that technology and looked at other things like pipelines and heat exchangers. Uh -huh. um, so uh, today I, we're looking at you know a myriad of, of applications for this technology. Sure. Let's uh, let's run the, the quick little video. Uh, the first one is on a sort of a, a de-icing and, and how <laughs> ice behaves on, on these uh, uh, very hydrophobic surfaces, right? So I think on the left, yeah, you got an uncoated surface. And what I thought was intriguing about this video is how you see the drops in the middle one here are higher and rounder. And then when you look at the drops on the anhydra, they're even, they're almost perfectly spherical. I, you know, just been squashed a little bit. Then these go on, go on into a freezer and uh, after some time <coughs> lapse, right? The freezer is opened. <coughs> So, so the original work around this was um, reducing icing right. on heat exchangers for aircraft. Okay. <clears throat> so if these heat exchangers start to ice up, it's kind of think of it like your air conditioning system. Right. If it starts to freeze up, yeah. it won't perform so well. But but yeah, what you want is yeah, that ice to fall right off, right? So lately we've tried this on airplane wings mm -hmm. um, for both icing and uh, corrosion mm -hmm. uh, applications. And we've also... Um, looked at uh, power cables uh -huh, okay. that when, when it sure. rains and it ices, it can pull be heavy and, and pull right. them down. So. No, and, and again, it has, it's, it's an interesting example because it has these other implications too, because right now, de-icing planes, they, they spray chemicals all over it, right, and this stuff, and you've got to either clean it up or right. drain it away, but whereas a, a permanent de-icing coating would be uh, very clean. Exactly, and, and, and all fast. Cases, there's, yeah, there's no, no time for, yeah. so, so, so maybe closer to home, mm -hmm. since we don't necessarily have a lot of icing in Hawaii. <laughs> um, when we run these um, anti-icing tests here in, here in our labs, one of the things the guys did is, what they do is they, they will throw these um, test samples into um, our salt fog chamber. And I was noticing one day, I was looking at the samples in eight hours in the salt fog chamber in, in, with a steel coupon, I mean, it will look like it's been in there for for months. If that's what it feels. I mean, it really just corrodes, so accelerated. So there's a salt fog chamber, like, so imagine there's like a really, a, um, like a salt mist. Okay. And it's just like this chamber and it's just misting over and it's just, it almost you can't actually see the samples that are in there. It's okay. like a fog in there, but it's a fog of salt. salt. Okay. And it just corrodes things like sure. really quickly. But then when I was looking at the samples that were coated, they look brand new. Uh -huh. Right? And I looked at it and went, oh, these are the anti-icing samples. But I, I didn't realize, go, yes, of course, you know, it's preventing from moisture and water from getting into, onto the metal. Right. So this would maybe be a really great anti-corrosion coating. Yeah. <clears throat> which Excellent. we have lots of probably issues here in Hawaii. Sure, right, no, because things, things grow and, so fast here. And so we work um, with our friends at uh, Kyoya, at the Sheraton Waikiki, and some of these hotels, including the Moana Surfrider. And anything that's near the ocean will just sure. corrode and rust away in a matter of months. And so. 
at the Moana Surf Rider, they have beautiful um, light fixtures. They look like big bird cages. All right. Um, but they start to corrode very quickly. Even after being refurbished, um, they will start to corrode within three to four months. They start to turn brown. Turn brown. And so we actually just completed last year, um, early last year, um, coating about 12 or 13 of their light fixtures. Uh, and they still look brand new today. Oh, right? So it's an like incredible anti-corrosion coating. That, excellent, um, excellent. So that's part of the discovery and learning. Right? Yeah. It's like, huh, it's trying to make these connections. Of right, like, right. How do you take this and apply it to right. something different? And again, this is why I think this, this background that you talked about and having people sort of unlearn and relearn is really important. So right. take, take somebody who's trained as an electrical engineer and sort of get them looking right. at a biological problem. You know, so they, they have to really start stretching their brain right. and, exactly. and not bringing a typical biology background to the problem. Right, yeah. right, right. Excellent, excellent. Very cool. So there was some more on this, uh, <coughs> another video on, on the hydrof hydrophobic stuff here, right, too, that was uh, uh, looking more uh, at how liquid water behaves, which is actually not, not dissimilar. I, I love when these drops hit and you can just see they, st they stay as virtual perfect spheres as they roll down. Right. Yeah. <laughs> and then the, the super hydrophilic Thing. It just spreads the water out evenly. And it just kind of creates this right. bubble. Yeah. And again, both of those are, are, are interestingly different ways of dealing with how do you stop droplets from forming on glass. Right. And, and sort of two different strategies, right? The one you have it roll off, the other you spread it out into thin, even film. You know? right. But perfectly valid, maybe different uses for different ones. You know? So actually, out of this work, from the hydrophilic side, um, I work around cementing and creating cement fillet coatings. Uh, one of the things that is can be an issue is when you when two different materials come together, a lot of times they don't like each other. Right, so like this, this. Yeah, so <laughs> this, yeah. So in the case of like a steel casing or steel pipe, cement when you cement put cement around it, it those two surfaces don't really like each other. Right. But uh, we're able to create a coating that you can coat the exterior or interiors of a um, steel pipe, and so when you cement. They have this very, very tight kind of, they're hugging each other now versus before they would kind of be pushing from each other. Yeah, and they do the same thing in biology, right, to make biocompatible materials mm. so that your body doesn't scar up around them and try to sheath it out with a, a sheath yes. of scar tissue, but actually integrate <coughs> cells into it. Right. Yeah. We've actually coated some surgical instruments uh -huh. because you don't want blood and, and mm. flesh um, sticking to the, right. to the metal. To yeah. The scalpel. yeah, so you could, you could yeah, both, both ways are good. There's actually a lot of medical things that we, we tend to work on, which probably people don't realize. Yeah. A lot of medical applications, including um, some new materials. Um, so when a soldier gets, you know, unfortunately if you get shot, um, many times you'll bleed out. So the military has created some really great um, bandages that mm -hmm. will basically stop the bleeding. And so we're kind of creating the next generation of those kinds of materials huh. to instantly stop the bleeding. Wow. So, but the commercial market's become, yeah, so bandages that you have today, especially for people who are comp have compromised immune systems mm -hmm. or somebody who has diabetes, don't have great circulation or some autoimmune disease. You know, if you get a cut, it may take a very long time for blood to, because there's a very little circulation, right. It may take time for blood for this areas to, to basically stop bleeding right. or to even heal. So right. um, we're kind of creating the next generation of those blood clotting materials, but also um, next generation of skin materials that almost act like skin mm -hmm. to help yeah. to help the healing process. Yeah, yeah. No, this, so. is, this is critical stuff. This is this is how how the world got got to work. So uh, th those are just a few of the the, the areas. It right. seems seems like. Uh, and I understand uh, your CEO has interest in all sorts of other, uh, you know, I saw a, a yep. TEDx talk he did uh, wanting to have, do something with the roadways, it was very, it was very ingenious. Maybe Nanite? It's probably around Nanite, I would think. Yeah, we're developing um, a smart concrete okay. that, uh, I don't think of concrete as being either smart or stupid. I think of it as being concrete. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, it, it can be a really stupid, you know, kind of common building material. Mm -hmm. But we're, we're adding nanomaterials to it so that it can become a sensing material. Uh, okay. So maybe a smart highway that can tell if, it's, if there, there's damage uh, okay. or cars, trucks going over it. It can be... It can be used to weigh vehicles. Uh, okay, right. It, it sh show the stresses and strains so you can yeah. see if a, if a bridge is in need of repair or something before it. Gets or maybe somebody's stepping into, you know, we have big problems with 
people stepping into sidewalks when they shouldn't be, especially elderly people. Mm -hmm. So you can imagine having uh, this material. I mean, it looks like it's cement. Mm -hmm. I mean, essentially, man, any place that's cement uh, or you could put cement could become a sensor. So imagine, you know, an elderly person kind of stepping into the crosswalk. Um, but it's that, that place they're stepping is actually made out of this material. Uh -huh. And basically, you know, maybe lights start flashing, right. signals start flashing to let people know that, you know, you have a person stepping into the sidewalk. And so the drivers kind of wake up. Instead of just see green, right. the lights are flashing to kind of wake them up that there's somebody walking into right. the sidewalk. No, that could be very useful here. Yeah, I've, I've seen on some bar streets it's that kind right. of thing happening. Yeah, people just wander out. And <clears throat> Huh. Oh, that's a, that, that's a, again. Uh, see all these every, nice, practical, everyday applications of science. This is really <laughs> wonderful. This is this is what, what we've got to do. Is, right. is 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 you know, and you, you never know, right? You never know where where your product is going to go, right? You, right. You, you get this great idea, you develop some new phenomena, some new technology that allows you to do something, and then yeah, then you just begin to, to go in this discovery process, right? Right, exactly. So like even the anhydra things, we're starting to coat uh, wings for UAV aircraft okay. like for testing, because a lot of UAVs will have icing issues and things, so we're doing that, and then... Some of our, our yeah. smart guys and gals um, are going beyond just water and looking at how you can repel oil and mixed mm -hmm. substances. So, and one of the things we're looking at is maybe can you treat glass, the glass on your on your iPhone, so that it doesn't smudge with with yeah. the uh -huh. grease on your your fingers. That'd be great if it would. Yeah, repel it would, repel that, if it, if it, that oil. It would repel yeah repel the oil. Right, exactly. Yeah, that'd be, exactly. Yeah, that could that could be an amazing. Uh, I mean, all the, you have a huge market for it. <laughs> yes. Every, everyone's got these things, and everyone has to clean them off constantly, right? right? Exactly, exactly. Uh, yeah. And actually, that, the, the family of those coatings as well, um, I think you have a clip as well around um, some, uh, we've been testing these, um, some of these, and they're kind of an omniphobic coating. So you've seen super hydrophobic coatings and, and super hydrophilic coatings, okay. but those things, but actually we're creating coatings that will repel both water right. and oil, and so. So this, this is a nice little demo here being shown. There's a coating on for stone or cement or whatever uh, that, that basically uh, makes your makes it impossible to permanently graffiti it, right? Yeah. Uh, so you can, you can uh, you'll be able to, to as, as it'll show, you'll be able to scrub the, the treated side off very relatively easily. I think um, we get a brush out and yeah. try and scrub that off. Right, you know, you know how hard paint is to get out of, <coughs> off of either rock for finish or a cement right. finish, right? Because right. it's gotten into a porous surface. It's very, very difficult to. <coughs> exactly. But. Uh, and so, you know, there's been studies that, you know, the sooner you can get rid of the graffiti, um, the more you help to prevent future right. incidents. Yeah. Because now, they, you know, they know that as soon as it goes yeah. up, it's going to come down. Yeah. Excellent. <coughs> hey, well, this, this conversation could go on for hours very clearly, but unfortunately, <laughs> we're out of time, so it can't go on for hours. <laughs> uh, and so I'm going to have to wrap it up here. Uh, Ian Kittajino, uh, Ken Jung, both motionists, and I'm your host, Ethan Allen, here on Think Tech Hawaii. Please join us again next week. Hopefully.